Hey, what's up, Stock Compounders? Brad here. So today I'm going to share my highlights from the 1% show with Monish Pabrai, his Q&A with Vishal. This came out July 23rd, um, and I, I just missed that. That's when I went on vacation to Cape Cod. So coming back, I'm catching up on all these Q&A sessions that I've missed. So highlights from the 1% show with Monish Pabrai. Uh, right off the bat, he was asked, what makes you feel alive? And he says, what makes me feel alive is the end result of the process of culling. Okay, less is more. So basically, whenever Pabrai has an experience, right, say he goes out to lunch with someone, uh, does whatever activity, afterwards, he asks himself, you know, how much fun did I have doing that? And the answer to that tells him whether he's ever interested in doing that thing again. Most of the time, it's no, okay? So throughout his life, he's whittled away what the, the things that he really enjoys doing, okay? And, and that's all he really has time for uh, these days. So it's a process of culling. I have really basic needs in life. So for four years... Okay, when Pabrai was starting his business back in the 90s, um, he had lunch at the same Chinese restaurant every day okay, for four years. It was $4.27 for lunch. It was this same dish at this Chinese restaurant. I mean, that, that really sums up Pabrai, right? Simple needs. He knows what he likes and, you know, he does it. He repeats, and, and it's all fine and well. Uh, he doesn't need much variety, just what he likes. Uh, doesn't care what other people think, okay? He likes bridge. He likes reading, so that's mostly uh, how he spends his days. Doesn't like lots of meetings, okay? Likes to keep an empty calendar, uh, a lot like Warren Buffett. Um, so here's a success tip from Monish Pabrai. He says, a lot of humans will encounter something of interest, but then they don't take it further, okay? They just kind of skim off the surface. They go an inch deep on something, and then they move on to the next thing, okay? Pabrai is wired diff differently. When Pabrai finds something of interest, he wants to keep digging, okay? He wants to go down the rabbit hole. He wants to get to the end of the rabbit hole before he moves on to the next thing. Uh, and that's, you know, I think that's a common trait uh, for a lot of very successful people. If something grabs you, you have to be willing to go down the rabbit hole. It's what successful people do. Um, so then he's asked about, you know, how was the shift from Graham, right, buying a dollar for 50 cents to Munger, right, paying up for great businesses he says, the notion of investing in great businesses and paying up for them is not an easy notion when you balance that option against all of the other opportunities in the investing world. Um, what else? Interesting tidbit. The day the NASDAQ peaked in the dot-com bubble was the day Berkshire hit a multi-year low. So the way... The, the witty way Pabrai kind of describes that is you have people selling Berkshire Hathaway to buy pets.com. Okay, it was just a crazy time uh, back in that bubble. Um, so he talks about Nick Sleep, right? His learnings from 2020. Where I am today is you can't go all Nick Sleep. Okay, I was surprised to hear that because, you know, uh, a number of months back for, for a number of Q&As, Pabrai seems very focused on these small spawners, right? These sub 500 million market cap businesses uh, that are able to kind of multiply uh, either internally or by acquiring other businesses. Um, but he says, you can't go all Nick sleep, Okay. Buffett does well because he is a Swiss army knife. Brings out different blades for different opportunities, right? So sometimes Buffett uh, is paying up for great businesses. 
uh, at least paying up in the gram sense. Uh, sometimes he's buying a dollar for 20 cents. So there's all of these different tools that he has, all of these different frameworks for knowing when to be excited about an investment opportunity. I'm a little surprised to, to hear this from Pabrai because, you know, one of his Ten Commandments is thou shalt be singularly focused, okay? Um, so I figured, all right, Pabrai has a new focus here. He's going for these small spawners, these small compounders, compounders before the market sees them as compounders. Um, but, you know, it seems he's, he's willing to keep an open mind. He's not necessarily focused on just those kinds of opportunities. Um, so he says, it is definitely a great thing to do to buy great businesses and hold them for a long time if you can get them at reasonable prices. Uh, you can also do really well using Graham's techniques. Probably the right answer is some mix. Okay, so this is kind of that Swiss Army knife where you're uh, open to opportunities that fit into multiple buckets. Uh, Pabrai, ultimately, he wants to have his cake and eat it too. And what that means is finding businesses at gram prices uh, that are great long-term compounders. And, you know, he makes reference to this Turkish company that he bought in 2019, bought a third of the business. It was like a 19 million market cap in 2019. Uh, the warehousing company in Turkey, pretty sure it's Racist Logistics. Um, so, you know, he, he, he's buying this thing for about 20 million, at least that's the market cap, when he was buying and he figured it was worth 500 to 600 million. Okay, the, the assets were worth that. So he's buying a dollar for four cents, okay, which is incredible. That's like the stuff you hear about from Lee Lu back when Lee Lu was at Columbia shopping around in Russia for, you know, margin of safety like that. Um, has great assets and incredible capital allocators, all right? So again, he, he brings up racists pretty much in every Q&A is a little like, ooh, careful with that, Pabrai. You're really drilling in, uh, you know, one side of the story for racists. Drilling in those biases. But, you know, um, yeah, so that's, that's the ultimate. Gram prices with long-term compounder DNA. He's asked, and it seems like he's asked this in every Q&A, are we in a bubble? Right? What is kind of the macro state in the U.S.? He thinks the situation today is very different than it was during the dot-com bubble in 99 and 2000. We are not in a massive bubble now. We are in a very narrow bubble. In other words, there's really only 10 to 15 stocks that Pabrai sees in bubble territory. Uh, in the U.S., we have GameStop, AMC, Tesla, maybe Bitcoin. Um, it's not even 10 or 15 names, he says. And he goes off on GameStop a little bit about how it's a ridiculously useless company. It's not even worth $5 per share. Um, all of that. Uh, he says there's a complete disconnect from reality in a very small sliver of names. Okay, so that's... Uh, kind of summarizing what he sees today. Uh, to him, it's not clear that Amazon is in bubble territory or that Microsoft is in bubble territory. They might be overvalued, right? If you really come up with um, a, a solid estimate of what uh, the intrinsic value of Amazon or Microsoft is compared to what the market is pricing them at, there may be a little bit of overvaluation there. Um, by the market, but they're exceptional businesses, so they could grow in to that valuation, is how Pabrai is seeing that. Um, so he's not in the camp that believes everything is crazy in the market right now. The craziness is very limited. He's asked, how do you avoid FOMO? Okay, this is something a lot of us struggle with, including myself. 
He says, I'm not particularly interested in winning popularity contests. Okay. Um, the inner scorecard has helped me a lot. So, um, yeah, that resonates. The hunt is all about finding businesses like the one I found in Turkey. Okay. So, Pabrai doesn't have to have an opinion about what most others are talking about, right? Like what's happening with GameStop and AMC and Bitcoin and Tesla. He doesn't have to have an opinion about those things because those, those aren't in the portfolio. Um, he's looking for situations like racist where he can buy a dollar for four cents and have what, what the value of the assets are moving up over time, right? The goalposts are moving because you've got, uh, you know, great assets and an incredible management team behind the business. So uh, that, that's what he's looking for. Anything else, you know, it's really just noise. Um, so he's asked, this is, this is fascinating. If all you have is five minutes to assess an investment opportunity, what are you looking for? Okay. Uh, the first thing, does the business have great economics? And for Pabrai, you know, it's, it's pretty clear very quickly whether the business has great economics. Um, you know, high returns on equity, does it fit in your head as a great business? He's always had difficulty understanding Amazon's business model. Okay. And he notes that Jack Ma said the same thing about Amazon. Uh, Alibaba doesn't take ownership of the inventory and doesn't control the distribution, all right? And there's a very good reason for that. Uh, if Jack Ma had to control, excuse me, the inventory and the distribution, you know, they'd need, f what does he say, five, 10 million people, 10 million employees, okay? They have 25,000 employees and Jack Ma you know, struggles with managing 25,000 employees. So, you know, it's just mind-boggling what Amazon has taken on. Uh, but the upside is um, Amazon locks you in, right? They control the whole thing, uh, whereas Alibaba just controls the digital pipe. Um, it's sort of like a, um, a toll booth, in a sense, so, yeah, it's, it's pretty fascinating what, uh, what Amazon has done. But the model, you know, never made sense to Pabrai, the, the Amazon model. Clearly, they've, they've figured out how to make it work. Um, but, you know, it was a long shot. And, you know, Buffett and Munger, I think, this, say, say the same thing about Amazon. What Bezos has been able to do with Amazon, I mean, it's, it's just remarkable, um, what what Bezos has been able to accomplish and, and the whole team there. Uh, they're two very different approaches. Uh, the downside of Alibaba's approach is that the link to the customer isn't as strong, right? We kind of talked about this already. Amazon approach locks you in, right? You've got, you know, the, the prime fee. You're a member, right? You're bought into this thing. It's a, It's the same... It's similar with Costco, where, you know, you're paying this recurring fee each year to be, you know, part of the ecosystem, to be part of the family, in a sense. Uh, and Alibaba, you know, doesn't have that. Um, so the 30-second approach to Amazon is a pass, right? The numbers just don't make sense. It doesn't make sense if you're ordering a $4, you know, pack of band-aids or a bundle of band-aids on Amazon um, that it could be delivered next day, right? Amazon gets maybe 25% of that. They get a dollar of that $4. Uh, and then they've got to spend who knows how much on the delivery, right? Um, so it's, you know, it, it's a very long-term game that Amazon is playing uh, that's clearly worked so far. Uh, something like MasterCard would very quickly make sense, right? You get a certain percentage every transaction, and it's just a bunch of servers. So as you add on customers, the incremental cost 
of doing business, of, of adding on uh, for, for MasterCard, for Visa. I mean, it's, it's virtually zero. Um, so it's, it's a very scalable model. Um, and then, so that's the first question. Does the business have great economics? Uh, the second question, which is a much harder question, is the business durable, right? Does it have a moat? Can it continue to be the same kind of business as it is today with great economics a decade, two decades from now? Um, is it durable? Uh, Terry Smith, so as Pabri mentioned in a previous Q&A, he's reading um, the book by Terry Smith. Uh, I forget exactly what it's called. I just ordered it. It's on its way. Um, Investing for Growth, I think, is, is the name of the book. Terry Smith says, I don't want to pick winners. Okay, that's a very hard game to pick winners uh, before it's clear that they're actually winners. I want to call the winner after the race has ended. Okay, and invest then. All right, after it's clear that they are the winner. The company must have a long history. Okay. Obviously, you've got to have a long history to be dubbed the winner. Um, you're not going to find winners in kind of the startup space, in IPO land. It's just, it's just way too early in the game for those companies. And obviously, you're leaving a lot of upside on the table if, if you're doing it that way, waiting until the winner is clear. But, you know, if you can find clear winners that have... Uh, durability, right? And they still have a long runway ahead of them. Uh, maybe it seems like you're paying up when you buy into companies like that. Um, but if you're going to be holding those companies for a decade, two decades, three decades, uh, and it, it's true that in fact they did have a, a long runway ahead of them still, even after, after it was clear that they were the winners, uh, you can still do incredibly well. By, by taking that approach. So uh, that's, that's apparently how Terry Smith operates. But I'm excited to read that book soon. Um, he says, Pabri says, all bubbles have a kernel of truth at their core. Okay, that's, that's how they become bubbles. Uh, the herd sees this truth and they extrapolate it to, hey, this business is going to go to the moon, right? Because... There's something at the core, you know, that, that's actually true. But the extrapolation, uh, it's, it's taking it beyond what, what reality, um, you know, dictates. We don't grow with success. It is the failures that help us grow. Okay, success really doesn't teach you anything. I'm always grateful for the failures, right? What a humble thing to say. And obviously, it's very painful to go through failures, um, but they provide the best lessons. If we can look at our failures and be willing to extract the deep lessons there, I mean, that's, that's just the, the fastest way to grow, the fastest way to um, learn is to be open to teasing the lessons out of those failures uh, he talks about Guy Spear, right? Monish Pabri and Guy Spear are very close. The thing I find amazing about Guy Spear is how little he touches his portfolio. Uh, you know, I, I joked about this in a recent tweet, how uh, Guy Spear had a flurry of activity in quarter two. He bought two things. He bought Alibaba and Daily Journal. And I think he sold out of Wells Fargo, right? And that was like more activity than he's had in the last couple of years combined. Um, so uh, Guy Spear, to Guy Spear, it's a great year when no changes are made to the portfolio. Okay, so it's a very different framework uh, in terms of activity that most investors have. Most investors, you know, if they haven't done anything in the last three or six months, they, they start to get antsy. Like, uh, I need to find, you know, great investments in order to to make it to the promised land. But for Guy Spear, it's like, hey, I'm already sitting on all, on all of these golden eggs. I just need to have the patience 
to really let them hatch. Uh, so that's, you know, Pabrai really respects that about Guy Spear. Um, Monish was trying to talk uh, Guy Spear into looking at racists, right? This um, warehouse company in Turkey. Spear said, there's no way in hell, Monish, that I'm ever putting $1 into Turkey. Okay. <laughs> End of conversation. Uh, he wants to be extremely comfortable in what he owns. It doesn't bother him if it's suboptimal. Okay. For Pabrai, it would bother him, you know, it would bother the hell out of him if it was suboptimal. Okay. Pabrai is really about optimizing. Um, you know, he's an engineer by training. He's really looking to uh, make the engine, right? Make the aircraft carrier, as he calls it, uh, function as efficiently and optimally as possible in this game of compounding wealth over decades. Um, he leaves these things alone for a long time, and that's the key, right? That is, that is the, the golden ticket for us investors is to get these these great businesses into the portfolio at reasonable prices and then leave them alone, okay? Uh, holds them through thick and thin, up and down, turbulent, you know, turbulence all around. Uh, Pabrai has a lot to learn from that. So humble statements uh, there about Guy Spear. Life lessons to your kids. <laughs> so he's asked, you know, how, what wisdom have you tried to impart onto your children? Uh, your kids are not going to learn from what you tell them, okay? You can't download your values to your kids by telling them what they should value, okay? That's just going to go in one ear and out the other. Uh, but they do learn by observing you, okay? Your kids are constantly observing you know, how you act, how you respond to different things in your life. They're absorbing everything. They're, they're these little sponges, uh, which is a little terrifying. You know, myself having almost a three-year-old and just shy of a one-year-old, I'm, you know, more and more aware that I'm being constantly observed. Um, don't screw it up. Um, yeah, so that's lessons to kids. But Brian mentions, he's mentioned this in, in previous Q&As as well. Uh, a lot of people in investing have never run a business, okay? And they try to look at things through a spreadsheet, look at the business through a spreadsheet, right? Come up with these very detailed and accurate discounted cash flow valuations. I mean, <laughs> look at Aswath Damodaran, right? Go and look through his videos on YouTube. Look at the last company that he's valued, Okay. You can find the link to his spreadsheet in the description for the video. Uh, there's like eight tabs for this spreadsheet, okay? Uh, you know, 30 or 40 inputs. I mean, it's just insane how complex these spreadsheets are. And don't get me wrong. I have a ton of respect for Aswath Damodaran. Um, but, you know, I, I'm curious if Aswath Damodaran has ever run his own business, okay? Or if, you know, it's it's based on these spreadsheets and how complex they are, I'm guessing he hasn't. Uh, so, you know, you may be able to do a good job of valuing a business um, through a spreadsheet. I don't know. Pabrai doesn't seem to think uh, that that's the right approach to it. Um, he says, you really have no idea what's going on if you're trying to understand a business through a spreadsheet, uh, through numbers alone. Um, obviously, numbers, the numbers are based on your stories, right? What stories and numbers. I think that's the latest book that Aswath Damodaran put out. Um, but according to Pabrai, it's really only two, three, four variables that matter in a business. So if you can't tease those out of the spreadsheet, uh, you're just swimming in numbers. Okay. Um, 
most startups need to be heavy on marketing and sales. Okay, this is a lesson that Pabrai learned very early in his life as his dad was a serial entrepreneur, uh, failed in 15 different businesses across, you know, maybe 15 different industries. Um, a lot of entrepreneurs, right, a lot of startup founders, uh, they focus on what they like to do, all right? That's all they want to do. They, they want to do what they like to do, what they're good at. But what you really need as a startup, you need marketing and sales skills. And this is something that Naval talks about too. I'm reading the almanac of Naval Ravikant. He talks about how, you know, to be really valuable in business, learn how to build and learn how to sell. And if you can do both of those things, I mean, you're invincible. Like you are going to be successful. Uh, but most entrepreneurs, they don't have the sales skills and they are skills, right? Anyone can learn how to sell. Uh, some people are naturally going to be better at selling than, than others, uh, but it is a skill that can be learned. Um, and then finally, he's asked, if you could only keep one book and had to give the rest away, which book would you keep? And of course, you know, it's, it's no surprise what Pabrai answered to that one. Poor Charlie's Almanac, uh, which is, you know, based on the life lessons of Charlie Munger, who's sitting behind Pabrai, uh, this statue of Charlie Munger, his, his mentor, um, his role model. Uh, is is really Charlie Munger. So I should probably revisit Poor Charlie's Almanac. Uh, it's it's not something I've cracked open for a while. I know Pabrai likes to read it once a year, and he says, you know, every every time he reads it, he finds something that it seems like he's seeing for the first time. And you know, I, I guess when when he's read it in the past, he just wasn't he wasn't at a place in his life. He wasn't ready to really. Uh, take that information in. So just so so much great stuff in uh, Poor Charlie's Almanac. But anyway, guys, that, that is all for my kind of highlights, my summary of Pabrai's recent Q&A with The One Percent Show. Hope you enjoyed this. Um, it's awesome. We get like two Q&As every month from Pabrai. I'm hoping we get another one very soon. Uh, and you can count on seeing one of these highlights videos from me after the next one as well. So stay tuned for that. Uh, that's all I got for today, guys. I will see you all in the next video. Take care.